like to call the uh, June 24th, 2024 regular scheduled board meeting to session. Um, Ms. Blackburn Hines is unable to make it with us tonight. We'll uh, continue to keep her in our thoughts and prayers as she continues her fight in front of her. Um, jumping right into it, the uh, welcome remarks. Um, for the invocation, if we would, please bow our heads. Lord, we come humbly before you as we ask for your guidance, support, and understanding as we navigate these decisions. We ask for your continued guidance to make sound judgment and remember that our responsibility is to serve. We ask this in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> And that is going to take us straight into number eight on our agenda, school board spotlight. Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Dr. Ross. Thanks for having me tonight. The good news is that celebrations don't stop in the summer. We still have um, lots of good news to share and celebrate with all of you. Um, 33 School District 5 students participated in Palmetto Girls State and Palmetto Boys State a couple weeks ago. These students were selected based on their leadership skills and involvement they've shown in their schools and communities. They were able to experience governmental procedure with um, by simulating political campaigns, elections, the political process, while learning about the principles of citizenship and public service. Uh, one of our girl state attendees was actually selected to run for the governor position uh, while she was there. So th I hope that that was a an exciting opportunity for her and a great experience for all 33 of our students. And then I do have a little bit of breaking news for tonight. We heard last week from the Education Oversight Committee that our Spring Hill High School has been awarded the committee's first ever Data Trailblazer Award for the high school level. A Data Trailblazer School assists ed educators in assessing, interpreting, and communicating data while demonstrating improved student outcomes. They help families and caregivers interpret their students' grades and assessment scores. They establish and maintain a culture of school-wide data-informed decision-making with the goal of improving student outcomes. And they incorporate practices and policies that prioritize data protection. So we are indeed grateful for Dr. Lofton and his team for the great work they're doing there and are happy to celebrate this with them tonight. So thank you very much. And that takes us to number nine on our agenda, the superintendent's report. Dr. Ross. Thank you, Derek, for getting that air for us. Um, as always, we are uh, a system guided by three critical questions. The first one is, why do we do this uh, work, our vision? And our vision is that we love and grow our students. The second one is how do we accomplish this why? And that's our mission that we're focused on academic, social, emotional growth and development. And our third is uh, what? Uh, what is our strategic plan goals? Our 24 goals measuring school climate, uh, teacher administrative quality, student achievement, and our gifted and talented strategies. We work each and every day to make sure that we can bring realities of these uh, strategic plans uh, for all of our students and staff. I just wanted to uh, point your attention to our year in review. We have a video that will be released later this week of uh, some exciting highlights, uh, just as Ms. Taylor has read to us. Uh, but we want to put these in pictorial form. Uh, you have in your package just some highlights from uh, this year. but. Uh, this does not, uh, this is just a, the, the tip of the mountain of the uh, amazing work that has been achieved this year. And so we, as we go into next year, 24-25, just wanted to highlight some of the amazing uh, work and look forward to the release of that video. Uh, at this time, we'd like to move forward with our monthly financial update. I'm going to ask our interim CFO, Ms. Marty Rawls, to come forward uh, to bring us our April monthly financials. Good evening, Mr. Chair, fellow, not fellow board members, but board members and Dr. Ross um, have the April 2024 financial update. As you can see, as of the end of April, 
Um, we have received approximately 1% more in revenue than we had at the same time last year. Our uh, revenues are coming in very strong. Uh, the state will, uh, once the, the year is completed, they will be um, pretty close to what our original budget numbers were. Um, everything looks like it's on par to me. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer questions about the revenue. Okay, and then they go to the expenditures summary. And on the expenditures summary, um, similar to the revenue, we're actually below where we were this time last year. So a win-win on both sides of that. Um, one thing to remember is our teachers get paid on a different payroll schedule as our other staff. So the teachers still at this point in time still had, um, I believe, let's see, April, May, seven more paychecks to um, come out of the 23-24 year. So um, there's still a good bit that is encumbered as of this year, um, looking at salaries um, major for the majority. Um, one thing I also wanted to bring up is when you're looking at these reports, the bonuses that were paid last year in November and the signing bonuses are coming out of the budget that you see here. But remember, you put fund balance assignments for those. So in total, we have um, fund balance assignments of about $3.5 million. So uh, the bonuses that are in there, they're in the 100-100 um, the sections of the budget. However, they will be covered through fund balance assignments. So we actually have a little bit more budget available um, in here than what you're showing because we don't uh, budget for the fund balance assignments. But I am happy to answer any questions um, on this as well, on the expenditures. Okay, thank you. Uh, before you take your seat in the role, I just want to uh, thank you for your service. This is her last board meeting with us, and uh, we want to thank you so much for your hard work, your dedication, uh, understanding how to handle so many lines of our budget, the inflows, outflows, but also understanding the needs of those, those teachers and those students at the ground level. Your creativity, your philosophy, your ability to meet the, the levels and the needs of our district has been extraordinary. I thank you for that. And uh, there has never been a moment, whether it's 1 o'clock in the morning after you need to call on her on the weekends, holidays, Christmas Eve, I remember. Uh, uh, Ms. Rawls has been there to support. So we always honor with a small token uh, our Center for Advanced Technical Studies creates out of the Machine Tools Shop the Heart Work Award uh, for telling our D5 story. And I just want to thank you for being a huge part of our D5 story. With that, Mr. Chair, at this time, I would like to share with you, we have done, uh, completed our administrative uh, summit, our superintendent summit with all of our administrators. And at that uh, summit, we had a presentation on election do's and don'ts. I want to share that with this body uh, so that you're aware of what we're sharing with our administrators, as well as what we uh, will share with our staff, so we can continue to share with our staff so that if there's any comments, uh, that we would have that at this time. So I'm going to ask Ms. Amanda Taylor from Communications to come forward with that presentation. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Good evening again. Um, I was glad to be able to share with all the principals and administrators and directors at the summit um, about election do's and don'ts. Um, it is our, our goal and our hope to have all of our employees be informed and active participants in the election process while still staying within the guardrails of um, our state law. So um, hopefully this is helpful information um, for everyone. Um, there are basically two sections of state law that are part of the Ethics Act of 1991 that um, kind of guide us through the um, election process for government employees and properties. I'm not going to read this. This is a lot of words. Um, but I'll just say that um, <laughs> subsection A here says it tells us what we can't do. We cannot use public funds, property, or time to influence an election. Subsection C, however, tells us what we can do. We can 
prepare informational materials, we can conduct public meetings, we can respond to questions from individuals or media. So, um, so this, is, this is clear and, and it's very helpful to us. But I do wanna, I wanna um, highlight one thing here. They tell us twice in the same um, section of law that we may not use public funds, property, or time to influence an election. So I believe that they take that very seriously. So therefore we are going to take it very seriously and, and follow that guidance. The next section, again, um, I'm not gonna read it, but um, it has to do more with our facilities what we can and can't do with our facilities. Um, so um, what it does tell us, however, here, it reiterates that this restriction only applies to government time and property. So um, what people do on their own time or on their own property is, is fair game for them. There, there are not restrictions in that area. So um, again, they've, they've told us three times now that what we can, can and can't do. So. Um, I, th I think we will we will follow that. And so, using those sections of law, we um, have a very brief list here of can dos and cannot dos. Um, and I, I draw special attention to the to the top on official time using public resources. When we are not on our working time and when we're using our own resources and property, the cannot do's really turn into can do's. Um, there, there are not many limitations when um, we are not acting as a public employee on public property. But um, just to highlight again here on the left side, the can do list, you'll notice that it's very, it's bland. It, the words are very generic, explain, provide list information what where the cannot do list is a little more uh, a little more emotional maybe is the right word um, promote advocate support or oppose so I think um, those are those are good um, distinctions to make where can do is very factual very informative whereas cannot do is um, more feeling and emotion um, and persuasion so we want to um, avoid those on official time using public resources. During um, the presentation, we guided our principals on some instructional matters. Um, teachers may often ask, can I have a mock election in my classroom? And they can, as long as it is a relevant part of their curriculum and is in line with the state standards for the class that they're teaching. So, and then, but we also want to make sure that the teacher remains very neutral and does not advocate on behalf of a party, a candidate, or a position. And we also um, would not advise having any sort of debate about the bond referendum because that may put someone in a position of having to um, promote or for or against it. So this would be strictly um, a political election for some sort of political seat, more so than a, a ballot question. Um, and then another frequent question that principals get is, may I invite a political candidate to my school or to my classroom? And um, the answer is yes, as long as every candidate running for that seat, that particular office is invited. Um, it's okay if everyone does not attend, if, if some decline the offer, that is fine but we have to make sure that we are being fair and impartial to all candidates for an office, so we want to make sure everyone is invited. Then we went through some possible questions. Um, we had a little, little interactive session, um, thumbs up or thumbs down, or, or some thumbs sideways on some of these um, possible questions that, um, that the administration may get. So that was um, a helpful time to kind of talk through some, some of those items. Um, and then just as a way to wrap up, again, we stress that it is so important for public employees to be informed and involved in the political process. Outcomes of elections affect government employees. And so we want everyone to, be, to vote and be informed on the issues. Um, but there, there are two very, important distinctions to make, personal time and resources versus working time and resources, and to keep those 
keep those very separate and understand what can and can't be done in both of those areas. And then the other distinction is educating versus influencing. And we want to make sure that when we're on work time on public property using public resources that we are only educating, that we are not seeking to influence at all. Um, I reminded um, the administrators that um, communications using district devices are subject to the Freedom of Information Act, so that's always, always a helpful reminder no matter what we're talking about. And then also that there are two board policies that um, reiterate all of the same information. And then we took questions, and I will do the same now, if, if you have any. Any questions, Ms. Taylor? Seeing none. Yeah. Dr. Ross? Well, thank you, members of the board. We appreciate that presentation, Ms. Taylor, and keeping us updated. Uh, that concludes the superintendent's report, and I stand for any questions. <clears throat> do we have any questions for Dr. Ross's report? See none, we'll go straight to number 10.